Part 1 Chapter 1 From beneath the train, iron wheels clacked against their rails, speeding along the track as one great beast. Giant plumes of steam shot from its metal smokestack as it roared along the plains. The horizon stretched out for miles and miles of flat land. It was devilishly hot inside, even with the train windows cracked to allow in the desert air. Ladies fanned themselves, and gentlemen pat their sweat casually whilst reading the newspaper. Currently, the train was on its way from Georgia through Mississippi and into the new land of the Arkansas Territory. Directly in the middle of the compartment, riding beside her mother, little ten-year-old Violet Donovan stared out the window, watching the horizon pass by. Violet was the curious sort, with big brown eyes evenly set and a peachy, soft face. Her curls were loose and matched her eyes, tucked currently into a pale blue bonnet. She wore a blue dress, done up with lace and bows along her hems. It was the nicest dress she owned. Despite the heat, her mother insisted she wear it. Mrs. Donovan, sitting beside her child, rode otherwise alone. The ring on her right finger suggested a widow, and the price of her dress implied her wealth. Violet laid her arms along the edge of the window, staring mindlessly towards the horizon. Even the glass was hot, but Violet didn't mind. What's Arkansas like, Mama? she asked. Does it look like this? I suppose so, said Mrs. Donovan. She took a photograph from her clutch purse, examining it. On the back was an inscription in pencil. Donovan Estate, Arkansas, 1874. All I know is what the house looks like. It's so much smaller than back home, said Violet, looking at it. Do I get horses? Of course, sugar. Maybe not as many. Violet went back to her window. Don't see why we gotta move anyhow, she said. I liked home just fine. Things change, Violet. Her mother returned the photo. Doesn't mean it'll be a bad change. Hmm. Violet tapped her fingers on the glass, leaving little smudges behind. As her mind wandered, something peculiar caught her eye. An unusually thick cloud of dust kicked up like a storm, just a few yards away from the train. Looking closer, Violet saw horses obscured by the cloud. A thrill of excitement shot through her, and she turned to tug on her mother's arm. Mama, she said excitedly, Horses! I saw horses outside. Men riding them, too. What? Don't be silly, child. But Mrs. Donovan looked out anyway. To Violet's surprise, the horses and their riders were gone from sight. Mrs. Donovan clicked her tongue. I swear, your mind gets away from you sometimes. But I really saw them, she swore. Honest! Yes, Violet, Mrs. Donovan closed her eyes, resting her head against her seat. Disappointed, Violet went back to the window, eager to find the mystery horses again. She saw no sign of them. With a sad huff, she laid her forehead against the hot glass, wondering if she had in fact imagined it. That's when she heard rustling above them. Violet looked around and saw that a few other passengers noticed the noise as well. Violet pushed herself to her knees, craning her neck over their many heads to see if something was happening. Shouts of surprise echoed through the compartment like an ocean wave. People fell back, women clutched their pearls, 
and young Violet braced herself against the headrest of her seat, staring at the back of their train car. The door, just seconds ago, had been kicked wide open. In came two bandits, bandanas covering their lower faces. The first was a colored man, a derby low on his forehead. Wire-frame glasses pinched his nose. In each hand, he held a loaded six-shooter, both of which were pointed at the terrified passengers. The second, carrying a dangerous Winchester rifle, was a Chinaman, his hair long and braided down his back. He wore a cowboy's hat, the brim nearly hiding his dark eyes. All right, y'all, stay still and keep your hands where I can see them, the first man barked orders, leaving the passengers cowering in their seats. When the panic settled, the two slowly made their way through the compartment, eyes scanning the crowd patiently. Violet's mother grabbed her tight and pulled her into safety. Still, both frightened and fascinated, she struggled to watch. Now, the bandit continued, Comply with our request, and we shall rid you of our presence right quick. We're looking for a Mr. Randolph Johnson. They continued to walk through the train car until they were just parallel to Violet's seat. She watched through her mother's arms as the man continued to search. Violet turned to the second. His face had not changed expression, his eyes sharper than knives. The Chinaman turned suddenly to where Violet was watching him. He didn't seem too old. Violet felt his eyes pierce into hers. Yet as frightened as she was, she couldn't look away. Their gazes only broke when Mrs. Donovan shielded Violet with her arm. Come now, the first bandit continued. There's no need to try and hide, Mr. Johnson. We know you're here. We know your face. And we think you know why we're here for you. That's when he stopped, spotting a rotund gentleman near the front row. There we are. Randolph Johnson, a squat, fat fellow with an expensive suit, burst from his seat and tried to escape through the front door. But as he did, it swung open to reveal an Indian twice the size of a normal man. His face was not covered, and his features were square and serious. His black hair was tied in a knot beneath his own cap, which barely fit his huge head. Johnson, sweating, turned back and forth. Guns behind him, a beast before him. He truly had nowhere to run. Near the middle, a man began to stand, perhaps to alert the conductor or try and help himself. But with a cock of his rifle, the Chinaman kept him at bay. Keep still. His voice, Violet immediately noticed, was unlike a man's in every way. Why, this person was a woman. The well-meaning passenger quickly sat back down, his wife clutching his arm. The woman pulled her rifle away and nodded to the Indian standing at the doorway. Without a word, the native grabbed Johnson by his collar and yanked him through the door and up to the roof of the train. The black man followed, but the woman lingered. She turned her rifle at the ready, though no one dared go after them. Once more, her eyes fell to Violet. Violet hadn't cowered or looked away, as so many other children had. Instead, she sat in her mother's lap, staring intently at the outlaw, as if afraid to blink and miss something. Under her bandana, the woman smiled and shut the door behind her. The minute she was gone, a great commotion rose up with the passengers. Some brave men tried to get through the door, but found it barred from the other side.
Violet quickly rushed back to her window, with just enough time to catch the three outlaws riding away, Randolph Johnson dragging behind them in the dirt. Violet woke slowly. Outside her window, the sky was still somberly gray, but she could hear the birds and bugs begin to stir. The springs in her mattress creaked as she sat up, a sweat already coating her skin from the humid night before. Downstairs, she heard Charlie up and working on breakfast. She went to her washbowl and wet her hair and face. Patting it dry, she caught sight of her reflection. It'd been ten years since her move to the Donovan estate in Arkansas, and ten years since seeing the notorious Railwalker gang in person. Since then, Violet had grown into a respectable young lady. Her hair had transformed into a dark honey color, her childhood freckles fading. While her more innocent features gave way to womanly shapes, her eyes remained the same. They were still wide and brimming with curiosity. By the time Violet had changed for the day, the sun was starting to peak over the little town of Red Rock. Violet's home was near the end of the town, looking over the small stretch of buildings along a single dirt road. There was the general store, owned by Mr. Muntz, the barber, a schoolhouse, church, saloon, barnyard, and a few homes and businesses sprinkled here and there. Violet, came a call. Up yet? Breakfast's almost ready. Coming, Charlie. Violet gave her hair one last brush before heading downstairs. Charlie had been hired by Mrs. Donovan just a few days after their arrival. Born in the South and later freed as a young woman, Charlie moved out west to make a name for herself. She had pitch black skin and even darker eyes and hair. Only her smile and the white of her eyes contrasted her face. Violet had grown a good liking to Charlie, and Mrs. Donovan made it a point to pay her well. Good morning, Miss Violet, she said pleasantly. We've got hotcakes today. Oh! Violet looked over Charlie's shoulder with glee. What's the occasion? No occasion, miss, said Charlie with a smile. Just figured I'd make him. You're too good to me, Charlie. She kissed Charlie's cheek. You need any washing water? No, ma'am. I gots it already, thank you. Well, I'm gonna go see Maple before breakfast, said Violet. You be sure and wash up before you eat, Charlie called after her. Violet nodded and walked through the back door of the kitchen. The Donovan estate covered about 150 acres, most of it overgrown with trees. There was, however, enough open land to support a small group of horses, raised by Violet herself. Not minding the mud on the edge of her dress, Violet walked to the stable, where she heard pleasant burrs of her horses. She opened the door and stepped inside. Good morning, ladies. The horses replied in kind, and Violet went over to one particular stable door. Maple, the horse behind it, was butterscotch and cream-colored, whose eyes reflected Violet's own warm browns. Violet grabbed a handful of feed and brought it up to her. The horse happily gobbled it from her palm, leaving a puddle of spit in its place. Violet giggled. Today feels like a good day for a ride. How's that sound? Maple nodded her head eagerly, as though she understood the question. After breakfast, Violet helped Charlie with the washing and the silver. She never minded, even though her mother disapproved. Violet liked conversations with Charlie. She always had a story to tell, and Violet was an eager audience. Stories of adventure, of heroes and monsters. Even now as an adult, she would eagerly listen whenever she could. Today, Charlie retold the story of Bobby Hansen, a man lucky in cards, unlucky in love, 
and the Boo Hag. So night after night, Bobby's new bride would scuttle away just after he fell asleep, only to come back just before sunup. She'd never say where she'd been, and always acted so sweet in the day. Not knowing what to do, Bobby sought the advice of a hoodoo priestess ten miles out of town. You watch her, she tells Bobby. You pretend to be a-sleepin', and you watch her, and then you come back to me. Well, Bobby does as he's told and follows her one night up to the attic. He watches his wife sit at a spinning wheel and starts spinning off her very skin. Violet, hands resting on the edge of the silver pitcher she'd forgotten about, watched with eager eyes. The Boo Hag. The Boo Hag, Charlie agreed with a smile. Sure enough, Bobby comes back to the priestess to tell her what he saw. You've married a boo hag, she says. A shape-shifting witch who brings men to her boo daddy, who eats their flesh and bones. And if you don't get her first, that's exactly what'll happen to you. I hardly think this is an appropriate story for a young lady to hear. Both Violet and Charlie turned to see Mrs. Donovan at the door, a frown on her face. Really, Charlie, ain't you got nicer stories to tell? Yes, am said Charlie, but they ain't what Miss Violet likes to hear. Well, Miss Violet's done listening for the day. Mrs. Donovan turned to her daughter, handing Violet a small purse and a shopping list. Run down to the store and pick up what we need. Yes, Mama. She stood, leaving her unfinished silver to Charlie. Mrs. Donovan walked her to the front door, which was open to the hot, humid air. Mrs. Donovan was wiping her neck repeatedly with a small handkerchief. Violet had already put her hair in a bun to fend off the heat. She grabbed the shopping basket from the front door. I'll be back soon. Not too soon, I hope, Mrs. Donovan said, fixing up Violet's collar. Eustace Carpenter's been asking about you, you know. Violet scrunched up her face. Oh, Mama, is that what this is? You know I don't like him. I think you should give him a chance, sugar. He's a good boy, and he's wild about you. But, Mama... Violet turned to Mrs. Donovan in a final plea. He's just so... stupid. You hush, child, said Mrs. Donovan sternly. You're a woman now, Violet. It's time you start thinking about a family. What if I don't want one? Nonsense. We all want one. Besides, you're gonna need someone to take care of you soon enough. I won't have no spinster living in my house. But, Violet, Mrs. Donovan tucked a strand of her daughter's hair behind her ear. You've lived a free life, I'd say. I made sure you didn't want for nothing, not even after your daddy died. But there comes a time in every woman's life where you're done being a girl. This ain't like finding the right toy to play with. This is about finding a man who will take good care of you for the rest of your days. That carpenter boy has the land and the money to support you and yours. It's a proper match. Violet wanted to argue, but knew it was fruitless. Once her mother had decided something, it was nearly impossible to change her mind. Violet nodded and turned to leave, her eyes downward. Mrs. Donovan gave her a quick hug before sending her off. She wandered down the road, her mind full of her mother's words. Violet never liked Eustace Carpenter. When they were in school together, he pulled her pigtails and kicked dirt on her dress regularly. One day, he even put a toad in her lunch to make her scream in front of the whole class. Her mother insisted it was just the way boys played. After all, Violet was getting attention. She should be happy about it.
After the toad incident, however, Violet had had enough and punched Eustace square in the jaw. She'd gotten a good spanking and went without supper as punishment, but Eustace didn't pull her hair as much after that. Now that they were older, Eustace had started showing up whenever she went into town. He always invited her out, and she always declined. As Violet walked through the road of Red Rock, she smiled in greeting at the other townsfolk. The school bell rang out, some of the younger children running freely into town. The Dewdrop Saloon was opening its doors for the day, Mr. Harvey sweeping the front porch. Mrs. Stevens and her five children carried baskets of newly woven fabric into the tailors to sell. Little Tommy Hewitt walked his family's cow through the street, leading it by a rope around its neck. Its tin bell knocked back and forth with every step. Passersby waved and smiled back at Violet, some even stopping to make small talk. When she got to the general store at the very end, she was thankful to step into the shaded building. Hello, Mr. Muntz, she said pleasantly. Mr. Muntz looked up from his counter. He was a middle-aged man, balding rapidly, with a pointed nose and a warm smile. He hunched over quite a bit and often squinted to read or see who he was talking to. When Violet was little, Mr. Muntz often gave her little candies or bits of hard sugar whenever she came in with her mother. Hello, Miss Donovan, he replied. Here for some shopping? Yes, sir, said Violet. She opened her list and began to read. Where's Mary today? Out sick, said Mr. Muntz. She's been ill for three days now, poor thing. Oh, no. I should pay her a visit tonight, see how she is. Mr. Muntz nodded in agreement, his eyes on his ledger. That's a lovely thought. The store's bell jingled as three young men walked inside. The first two were Peter and Paul Hainsworth, twins that were both lanky with shaggy brown hair. The only difference between them was a scar Paul had beneath his right eye. They were accompanied by Eustace Carpenter. Violet turned back to the sacks of flour on the store shelf, trying desperately to keep her face hidden from Eustace as he made conversation with Mr. Muntz. However, it didn't take long for the three to notice her. Howdy there, Violet. Eustace approached with a sloppy smile. Eustace had always been a big lad, even when they were younger. He was stocky, with beefy arms and a thick neck. His ears stuck out at odd angles under his shortly shorn blonde hair. He wore worn-out denim coveralls, haggard boots, and a faded shirt. He and his family owned the barnyard for the town. Next to the Donovans, the Carpenters were the richest family there. Nice morning, ain't it? It's nearly one o'clock, Eustace, said Violet flatly. Oh, is it? He scratched his head with mild interest. Say, it's Saturday, Violet. How's about you come for a drink tonight at the saloon with me? Immediately, Violet wanted to say no. She felt Peter and Paul on either side of her now, effectively locking her into that space in front of the flower. She felt like a field mouse, trapped by rattlers. I'm busy tonight. Grabbing a small sack of flour, she stuffed it into her basket and ducked between Paul and Eustace, walking towards the sugar. You're busy all the time, Eustace complained. Just get your nigger to do your work for you. Charlie is my friend, said Violet defensively. Negroes don't make good friends, said Peter. Just good help, 
The three laughed, and Violet angrily threw another small sack of sugar on top of the pile in her basket, before storming over to the tins of coffee beans. As dumb as he was, Eustace seemed to at least notice when he'd upset a girl. He followed her, hands in his pockets. Come on now, he said. We was only playing. We didn't mean to offend you none. Violet glared at him, but said nothing. She grabbed a tin of coffee, but Eustace placed his hand on the top, keeping her from taking it. We won't talk bad about your Negro no more. Charlie, said Violet pointedly. And she ain't nobody's Negro. She earns herself a wage, Eustace. Charlie, Eustace repeated. All right, then. We won't talk bad about Charlie no more. Violet stared at him doubtfully and snatched the coffee tin away from his hand. Look, you don't never come out with me when I ask you. What do I gotta do to change your mind, Violet? But Violet gave him no answer. Instead, she turned sharply and walked her basket straight towards Mr. Muntz's counter. She could feel Eustace getting angrier. He marched up beside her and took her arm, making her jerk around in surprise. Don't you walk away when somebody's talking to you, girl. That's enough, boys. The calm voice of Mr. Muntz turned Eustace's head. The grocer looked over his dingy glasses, frowning. Miss Donovan has a lot to do today. Be on your way, Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Hainsworth. The boys hesitated, but Eustace let Violet's arm go, and the three left the store. Mr. Muntz shook his head. Sorry about that, Miss Donovan. Did he hurt you any? Violet checked her bare arm. There was a slight red mark where Eustace had grabbed her, but nothing else. No, taint nothing. She smiled at Mr. Muntz with gratitude. Thank you. I never thought he'd leave. You pay him no mind, Miss Donovan. Boys like that don't take much consideration for others. <laughs> Violet folded her arms as Mr. Muntz began to ring her up. I wish he'd learn some. Mama wants me to give him a chance. I'd rather take a hound dog over Eustace. Mr. Muntz chuckled. Well, in my opinion, Miss Donovan, you're pretty enough to have your pick of the litter. No need to settle on a hound. He winked, making Violet smile. That'll be one dollar and seventy-seven cents. Oh, and... Mr. Muntz dug through a small glass jar and handed Violet a wrapped butterscotch candy. That one's free. Violet paid and headed out, tucking her butterscotch into the pocket of her dress. The wind was cooler as the sun lowered in the sky. The trees shook as a gust played with their branches. Fields and fields of wild grass shifted like waves of an ocean. Violet, seated securely in Maple's saddle, rode with the wind. She bounced with every jump of Maple's canter, her fingers twisted up in her cream-colored mane. Maple took her around the open field and into the woodlands, darting through trees easily. After ten years of life there, the pair of them knew the Donovan estate by heart. By sundown, Violet laid in the grass, watching the orange clouds float by above her. Maple grazed next to her. You think this is where I'll die, Maple? The horse gave no answer. When we were in Atlanta, the world seemed so big. I remember running down the streets for hours, for what seemed like miles, miles and miles of streets.
she tugged at a few blades of grass. Now I'm here. A bird flew overhead, vanishing behind the tree line. Maybe Mama's right. Maybe I do need to start thinking about a family. She was my age when she got married. But I just don't know. Violet sat up, plucking a twig out of her hair. Ain't you supposed to be in love first? Or at least like the person somewhat? Maple walked over and gummed her hair affectionately. Violet giggled. Hell, I think I'd rather marry you if I could. Then we can go anywhere we wanted, and nobody'd say a word about it. Miss Violet, she heard Charlie faintly call from the property. Violet turned over her shoulder to see her waving. It's getting dark. Come on inside. Coming, Violet shouted back. She stood and hopped into Maple's saddle, trotting her back to the stable. There, she put her up for the night and came inside soon after. Mrs. Donovan was waiting inside. Supper's almost ready, she said. Did you say you were out after? Yes, said Violet. Mary Humphrey's been ill. I wanted to stop in and see how she's doing. Mrs. Donovan smiled. Well, let's wrap up something to take her. We still got some of that pie left. Good idea, Mama. They washed up and sat themselves at the table as Charlie served them their stew. Violet was reminded of Eustace and Peter's taunts from earlier that day. A strange thought came to her. Charlie? Both Charlie and Mrs. Donovan turned to her. Why don't you... Take supper with us tonight. She gestured to the empty chair with a smile. Seems silly, you eating in the other room. Her smile faded, however, as an awkward pause hung in the air. Violet, her mother looked concerned. What brought this on? She turned to Charlie as though expecting answers. Quickly, Charlie held up her hands. That, that's awfully kind of you, Miss Violet, but there's no need. I'll take my supper in the kitchen. Violet opened her mouth to say more, but Charlie hurried away before she could. Mrs. Donovan turned a concerned eye to her. Is everything all right, Violet? She asked, but Violet ignored her mother's question. Why can't Charlie eat with us? What's wrong about that? What do you mean, why? She eats with us at Christmas and sometimes Sundays. But why not every day? Violet. She lives here, don't she? She's part of our family, ain't she? That's enough now. Mrs. Donovan was starting to get angry. I don't know what brought this on, but I'll hear no more about it. Mama, I love Charlie. Don't you? Of course I do. She's good help and she's always made you happy, sugar. But listen to me. Not everybody in this life is worth the same. Violet felt her heart plummet. How, how can you say that, Mama? It ain't a bad thing, Mrs. Donovan defended. It's like, it's like you and Maple, honey. You love Maple, right? She loves you? That's all well and good, but you wouldn't want Maple to eat at the table with us, would you? Because there's a difference there. Charlie ain't a horse. You keep your voice down when talking to me, girl. Now you have been getting on my last nerve lately, and I won't tolerate much more of it. Frustrated and angry, Violet stood up and threw her napkin down to the table. You sit your hind end right back in that chair, or God help me, I'll make it so sore you won't sit for a week. You ain't too old for that. Violet ignored her. She stomped away, throwing open the front door and slamming it shut. Mrs. Donovan came running after her, but Violet picked up the pace.
racing out into the town, she didn't have to look back to know that her mother had stopped at the front porch. Once she was far enough away, Violet slowed to a halt and leaned up against the side of a building to catch her breath. It was dark now, with only the stars and the lit windows around her to provide light. Taking in her surroundings, she found herself past the saloon and closer to the churchyard. Immediately, she spotted the Humphrey household. There was a light on inside, so Violet approached. After straightening out her dress, she knocked. There was the sound of rustling inside before it opened. Mrs. Humphrey blinked in surprise. She was a frail woman whose thin hair was constantly pinned up behind her head. Violet? Hello, Mrs. Humphrey, she said. I came by to check on Mary. I hope I'm not interrupting supper. Mrs. Humphrey's face drooped. A sudden sadness struck her eyes, and Violet worried that she'd said something wrong. Mrs. Humphrey spoke again. Mary, Mary isn't well, Violet. Perhaps you can come another time? Violet inched closer. I can't see her? Not at all? Mrs. Humphrey paused with indecision. Finally, she nodded and stepped away. Violet noticed that a place had been set for Mary at the dinner table, but Mary wasn't there. Now even more worried, Violet went to Mary's door and gently knocked. Mary? she called. There was no answer at first. Mary, it's me, Violet. I came to see how you were. Violet heard nothing. She had just begun to turn the doorknob when the door itself finally cracked open. Behind it stood Mary Humphrey. Violet and Mary had grown up together, even though Violet was a little older. Mary had always been a sweet, quiet type with curly blonde hair and blue eyes. She never liked playing in the dirt like Violet did, and much preferred to read or sew in her leisure time. Mary was a bright, beautiful girl, which was why, upon seeing her, Violet barely recognized her. There was no color on her face. Bags under her eyes insisted that she hadn't been sleeping well. Her hair was a mess, and there was dirt under her fingernails. Mary? Hello, Violet, she whispered, almost as though she was afraid to be heard. Mary, what? I came over because Mr. Munt said you were ill. Mary visibly flinched at the name and retreated further into her room. Yes, she said, her voice even quieter. Quite ill. Is there anything I can... Mary shook her head. No, Violet. Nothing. Mary... Saying nothing else, Mary closed the door between them, and Violet heard a click of the lock. She stood there, unsure of what to do. She lifted her hand to knock again, but lowered it soon after. Turning, Violet saw Mrs. Humphrey in the kitchen, hunched into a handkerchief, crying softly. Violet approached with caution. Mrs. Humphrey? What happened to Mary? Mrs. Humphrey gave no answer and instead wiped her eyes and gestured to the door. Please, please just... Violet stood helplessly. Her heart, she felt, could sink no lower. She could only imagine what had truly happened to Mary. Perhaps she would ask Mr. Munts about it when she saw him next. With no word of goodbye, Violet left the house and stepped into the dark street. She turned one last time, opening her mouth to say something else, but Mrs. Humphrey had shut the door. Violet stared at the windows. She saw Mrs. Humphrey draw the curtains and snuff out the gas lamps.
Violet began to head for home. Mind in the clouds, she walked slowly through the dark. Occasionally, she looked up to the stars, as though they would supply her with comfort. They blinked silently on. She had just about reached the Dewdrop Saloon when she felt something bump into her leg. Blinking, she looked down. A boy, no older than nine, stared up at her. Now, Violet had spent the last ten years of her life memorizing the names and faces of the people of Red Rock. This boy was a complete stranger. He had vibrant red hair and a face spattered with freckles. His clothes were dingy and his boots were barely laced. Oh, said Violet automatically. I'm sorry, did I hurt you? The boy shook his head. Nah. I don't think I've seen you before, boy. What's your name? He frowned and put his hands on his hips. I don't tell no strangers my name. That caught Violet by surprise. Oh? Why not? They don't gots to know. I see. Well, what are you doing in Red Rock? They don't gots to know that either. Violet folded her arms. Well, there must be some reason a strange boy shows up in the middle of the night. Where are your parents? Or do I not get to know that either? He remained tight-lipped. Violet, too drawn in by curiosity, looked around to try and find some semblance of the boy's parents. Her hand, by default, rested beside her pocket when she felt something. Reaching inside, Violet pulled out the butterscotch candy Mr. Muntz had given her that day. Would you tell me for a candy? The boy's eyes honed in on it. Clearly, he had hit an impasse. What do I gots to say? What's your name and what you doing here in Red Rock? She lowered the candy, but pulled it back when he swiped for it. You promise to tell me? He nodded feverishly. Violet turned the candy over, and he quickly popped it into his mouth. Now, start with your name. Rory, he said without hesitation. Name's Rory McNabb. Well, pleasure to meet you, Rory McNabb. I'm Violet Donovan. See? Easy enough. Now, why are you here? Rory seemed less thrilled to say that part. I, uh, I'm trying to find somebody. Your parents? Nah, said Rory. A fella. A bad fella. This piqued Violet's interest. She leaned over curiously. What kind of bad fella? But Rory shook his head. Can't tell you more than that. It'll get me in trouble. A noise from the saloon pulled Violet's attention away. She looked up to see Eustace and the Hainsworth twins laughing at the front door. It was early in the evening, and already their faces were flush with drink. Violet turned back to Rory, but he'd already gone. Violet! Eustace shouted towards her, waving stupidly. Violet scowled and started walking back towards her house. Eustace rushed to block her path, Peter and Paul grinning from the porch. Hey now, Violet, why are you going off so soon? His calloused hands took her shoulders roughly, pulling her close. You decided to come out anyway, didn't you? Well, we can show you a good old night, can't we, boys? You betcha, yelled Paul. Come on inside and have a drink with us. We promise to get you to church tomorrow, yelled Peter. Violet squirmed her way out of Eustace's hands. No, thank you, she said pointedly. As she tried to sidestep Eustace, he continued to block her way. In no mood for games, Violet boiled. Please move, 
Not till I get me a kiss, slobbered Eustace. Violet pulled back in disgust. You are a vile idiot boy, Eustace Carpenter. And you're the purtiest girl in Arkansas. He now grabbed her waist, jerking her further in. Give me one little kiss, darling. Not on your life! Violet pushed and struggled, feeling his heavy hands tug on her dress. She could hear a few seams burst under his fingers. Let me, let me go, Eustace! Give me one kiss, Eustace shouted. Just give me one, Violet. Mr. Carpenter! A voice rattled them both, and Eustace looked over his shoulder. For the second time that day, Mr. Muntz had come to the rescue. He was glaring sternly at Eustace. Let Miss Donovan go, Eustace snarled. The moose, ya old buzzard. I said, let Miss Donovan go. Mr. Muntz stepped closer. Or should I call the sheriff to deal with you? Even soused, Eustace understood the threat. Slowly, he released Violet's waist, and she tore from his arms quickly. Mr. Muntz walked swiftly forward. Come along, Miss Donovan. Violet needed no further prompting. She hurried and followed Mr. Muntz towards his general store. Want me to escort you straight home? He asked. Or would you mind if we stopped in my shop a moment? I only stopped out for a quick spill. Violet nodded. Of course, Mr. Muntz. She followed him inside. Better than walking home alone with a drunk Eustace following her. The general store was eerie at night, the floorboards creaking under their feet as they made their way upstairs. Violet had never seen Mr. Muntz's loft. When he opened the door, she took a good look inside. It was a one-bedroom area, barely the size of the store floor below. A simple bed sat in the corner next to a small tower of books. A dresser sat unopened at the foot of the mattress. There was a desk for writing and oil lamps all along the room's walls. Shouldn't be too long now said Mr. Muntz. I just need to finish something. Please have a seat, Miss Donovan. Violet pulled out the desk chair and sat herself down, hands folded in her lap. Mr. Muntz began to flip through a few books, scribbling something in pencil. Now, I distinctly recall you rejecting Mr. Carpenter's invitation for tonight. He looked over his glasses. Did you have a change of heart? Oh, no, said Violet. I was just, um... She thought back to the fight with her mother. I was just checking in on Mary. Reminded of her friend, Violet's face fell. Mr. Muntz, do you know what happened to her? Mr. Muntz had gone back to his books. Happened? he asked. Yes, said Violet. She looks ragged something awful, would barely talk to me, and her poor mother's a mess too. It looks like, well, I don't know myself. I wondered if maybe you'd know a thing or two about it. The inquiry hung in the air as Mr. Muntz finished up his log. I can't say that I do, he finally replied. Mary got sick about three days ago now. Her mother mentioned she might be out till next week. But she works with you, Violet pried. Wouldn't you have heard something? He turned a page and continued writing. All I know is that she's ill, and all I can do is wish her better. Finally, he laid his pencil down and closed his books. There we are. He smiled at Violet. Orders to be filled by the end of the week. I'm afraid I'd left it to the last minute.
He tucked the notepad and book neatly to the corner of his desk. Before I take you home, he continued, would you care for a drink, Miss Donovan? Violet looked up, surprised. A drink? she repeated. Violet didn't drink often. A glass of wine at Christmas, a sip at communion, but nothing really beyond that. I... Mama wouldn't approve, I don't think. Oh? Mr. Muntz pulled a glass decanter from his wardrobe. Violet immediately admired it. It was a beautiful bottle, and most likely expensive. The liquid, she noticed, did not look like wine. Mr. Muntz uncorked it and began to pour two small crystal glasses. And why would she disapprove? You know me, don't you? Well, well, yes. As does your mother. Mr. Muntz set a glass in front of her. The amber liquid reflected the orange flames of the oil lamps. It smelled stronger than any wine she'd ever had. This isn't a pint of beer at the bar. You're in my home, and from what I can tell, you've had a stressful night. He sipped his own glass, leaning against the desk beside her. It's only neighborly of me. Hesitant, Violet took the glass in her hands. It was heavier than she first suspected. The glass looked so delicate. She glanced back up at Mr. Muntz one last time before taking a sip. Instantly, the bitter liquid bit at her tongue and the back of her throat. She scrunched her face tightly and pulled her head back. Mr. Muntz chuckled. Brandy, he said. It's an acquired taste. He sipped his own easily. Tell me something, Miss Donovan. May I call you Violet? Violet felt a prickle on her neck as he said her name. It unnerved her in a way she couldn't put to words. Still, she nodded. Of course, Mr. Muntz. Mr. Muntz nodded. Violet, he began again. How are you doing these days? How is your health? Violet was somehow surprised at the simple question. Perhaps because she was alone, at night, in a man's house, drinking liquor. Usually, one didn't make light conversation in such a telling circumstance. But Violet steadied herself. This is Mr. Muntz, she thought. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Well enough, she said plainly. It's getting colder at night, ain't it? Round this time, I mean. Last year I had a fever something terrible, but Charlie was able to whip up this chili oil concoction. Lord, it was the worst tasting stuff in the whole wide world, but she had me drink it all. I couldn't taste nothing for a full week after that, but sure enough, my fever broke the next morning. She hesitated. I'm, I'm saying too much, aren't I? Not at all. Cause Mama always goes on about me talking too much. When I was little, she used to smack my hands with a ruler. Sometimes that still wasn't enough to get me to shut up. I see. I remember one day at school, me and Mary were supposed to help with the Christmas service, but that dress Mama put me in was so unbearable. It was hotter than it should have been, I remember that. And I kept begging her to let me change even in the middle of the sermon. She stared at her drink. Mary. Oh, Mr. Muntz, I fear something truly dreadful has happened to her. And you know what I think? She snapped her face back up to Mr. Muntz. I think it was Eustace Carpenter. He must have done something to poor Mary. Assaulted her or the like. Like what he was trying to pull on me just tonight. We should go to the sheriff, Mr. Muntz. Violet? Hmm? Take another drink. Violet stalled before taking a delicate sip of her brandy. It didn't taste any better. Now, 
Mr. Muntz set his glass on the desk. I'm going to ask you something, and I'm going to need you to not ask me why. He turned to her fully, his eyes serious. I need you to forget about Mary Humphrey. A cold spell ran down Violet's spine. Forget about Mary? It was an impossible thing to ask. What do you mean, Mr. Muntz? I mean, Mr. Muntz began to clarify, that whatever it was that happened to her is none of your concern. It's for the best, you see. Think of all the trouble it would cause Mrs. Humphrey if you started sticking your nose into where it didn't belong. But Mary's my friend. Violet began to feel her muscles tense. She was uneasy and growing steadily angrier. I can't just forget my friend. And if something really did happen, then it would be up to Mary's family to deal with it. Don't misunderstand me, child. I'm sure you have the best of intentions, but you would only do more harm than good. And how do you know, Mr. Muntz? Violet stood, bubbling in frustration. I'd know, because I've been around quite a bit longer than you have. While Violet's voice grew louder, Mr. Muntz's voice grew softer. More than that, there was something deadly in his tone. Stay out of it, Violet. Why should I? I told you not to ask me why. Mr. Muntz stepped forward, and Violet felt smaller. It was like being cornered by Eustace, but worse. Eustace was a dumb dog, easily distracted by bone or an old shoe. Looking at Mr. Muntz felt like looking down the muzzle of a hungry coyote. Violet now wished that she'd taken her chances with the dog. What ain't you telling me, Mr. Muntz? Violet's voice was weakening, but she held firm. It's getting late. Mr. Muntz suddenly grabbed her arm. His bony fingers gripped her tightly. Perhaps it's time I walk you home, Violet. Not till you tell me a lady should know her place. Mr. Muntz began to drag her towards the door. She should know when to keep out of a man's business. Violet struggled and eventually managed to rip her arm away from Muntz's grip. She dodged around him and rushed towards the desk, though she realized it might have been best if she'd gone for the door. Violet turned as Muntz approached her, slowly. Her hands went behind her back, fingers feeling for the crystal glass of brandy that sat in the lamplight. Come now, Violet, said Muntz. This is all so silly. Let me walk you home. He took two more steps, and when he was just within reach, Muntz cried out as Violet slammed the glass against his temple. Twinkling shards of crystal fell from his face like snow as the brandy splashed wildly. Violet dashed back around him and went for the door. However, Muntz's hand flailed, managing to grab her skirts as she passed. Violet fell to the floor, inches away from freedom. She turned, horrified, as a bloodied Muntz loomed over her. Pestilent whore! He spat, now clasping his soiled temple. I'll have your neck for this girl. Or maybe. He loomed closer, Violet now trembling on the floor, too afraid to run. Maybe I should teach you a lesson like I taught your dear Mary. Mary! Muntz slammed his fist into the door, keeping it in its frame. She was quiet, that one, barely made a peep, even when she cried. You? Well, I think you'll be a whole different story. He knelt over her, his filthy hand grabbing at the front of her dress. He began to rip it as she struggled, 
I wonder. You really a virgin under all them skirts, Violet? Violet was sick with horror. Overpowered and head spinning, she could think of nothing to do but close her eyes and pray. She shut them tightly, heart beating against her neck as months clawed at her dress. God in heaven, help me, save me. As though her prayers had been answered, Muntz's hands suddenly stopped. In fact, he seemed to stop breathing altogether. Confused, Violet cracked her eyes open. There was Muntz, staring at her, with the end of a hunting knife sticking straight out of his neck. Violet was so shocked she couldn't scream. She could only watch as Muntz gargled his last breath, the blood dripping like oil down his gangly tendons. With a sudden pull, the knife was removed. Muntz lingered only a second and then fell to the side, dead as a doornail. Cold and woozy, Violet noticed a new figure standing behind Muntz, who was clutching the murder weapon. It was a woman, with deep black hair and eyes, dressed in trousers and boots. A bandana hung around the base of her neck, leaving Violet free to stare her straight in the eye. The woman, Chinese by the look of her, turned to Violet with genuine surprise, then it melted into frustration. With an exasperated sigh, the woman pinched her nose and said, Christ, it's gonna be a long night.